Welcome to Armenian Alliance Conversations. I'm Manyak Sakyan. Shortly after midnight on September 13, 2022, Azerbaijan launched a major unprecedented attack deep into Armenian territory. This was not a border clash. During this attack, there was indiscriminate shelling of 36 towns and villages. Civilians had to go into underground shelters to save their lives. 7,600 Armenians were immediately displaced. 192 homes were destroyed. Two schools and one hospital were also destroyed. 207 Armenians were killed or are missing, and 293 Armenians are wounded. 20 Armenian soldiers were taken captive. Many buildings and other critical infrastructure were damaged from shelling. There is horrific video evidence of the torture of Armenian POWs, and gruesome photos of killings by beheading. These are all war crimes. The nature of this attack and the fact that Azerbaijan is continually buying weapons has led a lot of Armenians to speculate that Azerbaijan intends to launch a full-scale war against Armenia. This attack has also had geopolitical reverberations, which we will discuss today. My guest today is Dr. Nerses Kopalian. He's an associate professor of political science at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. His fields of specialization include international security, geopolitics, political theory, and philosophy of science. He has conducted extensive research on polarity, superpower relations, and security studies. He is the author of World Political Systems After Polarity, the co-author of Sex, Power, and Politics, and co-author of Latinos in Nevada, a political, social, and economic profile. His current research and academic publications focus on geopolitical and great power relations within Eurasia, with an emphasis on democratic breakthroughs within authoritarian orbits. He has conducted extensive fieldwork in Armenia on the country's security architecture and its democratization process. He has authored several policy papers for the government of Armenia and served as a voluntary advisor to various state institutions. Dr. Kopalian is a regular contributor to EVN Report. He has written about the Aliyev regime, earned sovereignty for the Armenians of Artsakh, Armenia and diaspora relations, and about many of the problems that Armenians are facing today and possible solutions to these problems. Nerses, Welcome, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Before we talk about the latest attack on Armenia by Azerbaijan, I want to speak about the previous attacks first, because according to Arman Tatoyan, the former human rights defender of Armenia, the strategic positions that Azerbaijani, Azerbaijani soldiers were occupying in Armenia's territory allowed them to launch attacks from those positions. So if you could briefly describe for us all of the attacks that Azerbaijan has launched on Armenia since the end of the Artsakh war on November 9, 2020, and the context of those attacks. I want our viewers to keep in mind that we are only talking about attacks on Armenia. We are not talking about the multiple attacks on Artsakh since November 9, 2020. Thank you. Um, so Arman Tatoyan did note the uh, role that the incursions that Azerbaijan initially had made and how that has been part of the operation that they've carried out. But there's a lot more uh, strategic factors than what Tatoyan has declared. That's understandable because his area of expertise is <clears throat> specific to something else. Um, so fundamentally, Azerbaijan's policy is twofold. One that we call borderization is a concept that Russia had utilized uh, against Georgia in both uh, Ossetia and Abkhazia. And there's basically a process of creeping borderization where uh, one country basically implants uh, an incursion operation to another country, absorbs space, and creates questions as to what the proper borders are and manufactures a crisis based on the borderization process. Uh, the next, another concept is known as salami slicing, where you basically slowly take uh, small pieces of another country and try to normalize the process. So from uh, after uh, the 2020 war, we've seen Azerbaijan do this a multitude of times. Uh, what they did, for example, around uh, the Black Lake, uh, when they uh, made an incursion and absorbed uh, or had a presence there and attempted to control that territories within Armenia proper. 
Uh, they attempted that uh, in, in September of last year, what was a basically an eight, nine-hour battle in Sisyon, uh, that the Armenian troops were able to hold off to a large extent. And then, of course, we saw this at a very large scale um, last week in the direction of uh, both Gerard Unique, specifically the Jedmuk city, but as well as throughout the border all the way down to Salt in uh in Sunni. So this has been a continuous process, and it's part of a grand strategy. So it's not a specific instance of Azeris implanting soldiers or troops on Armenian territory and then carrying out an operation or two. The, the overarching objective here is for Azerbaijan to create a, a scenario uh, on the ground, right? have boots on the ground, change the facts on the ground, and utilize that as a negotiating technique. And their underlying argument is that if Armenia is not going to recognize uh, Artsakh, Nagorno-Karabakh, as being part of Azerbaijan, then Azerbaijan is not going to recognize Armenia's territorial integrity in return. And they're going to do that by basically having a presence on Armenia proper to use it as a leverage. Um, Eric Hakopian of CivilNet recently said something which I think not a lot of Armenians had considered, which is that he said that even if there is a border demarcation process and we say that this is Armenian territory and this is Azerbaijan's territory, there is no guarantee that the Azerbaijani troops that are occupying Armenia's territory will leave peacefully. And I want to point out that Azerbaijan denies that they have troops occupying parts of Armenian territory. They say that they are on the border. So in effect, according to them, wherever Azerbaijan's troops are, that is the new border between Armenia and Azerbaijan. And I'm sure that Aliyev will advance that position, as you rightly explained, in any border demarcation process, because the aim is to change the facts on the ground. It's unfortunate that the international community has been using the excuse of an undemarcated border to not explicitly condemn Azerbaijan's attacks and incursions into Armenia. Um, so these are very, very good points. Um, you know, I've had this conversation a lot with Eric Hakop and myself. Um, the, the underlying uh, argument is that, you know, uh, the assessments or understandings of international law are, are really not the underlying factor here meaning Azerbaijan utilizes those arguments, but it's basically a question of might. They're powerful at this point in relation to us. There's a power disparity, and so they're attempting to impose a will. So uh, in that context, correct, negotiations could be expansive about border demarcations. Uh, this is very clear. They have manufactured a crisis that doesn't exist in reality. And they are attempting to utilize that to their advantage. So the borders really aren't a question here. And the international community understands this. But the international community at this point is more concerned with the situation in Artsakh than they have ever been on the border issues of border uh, of Armenia and Azerbaijan. Because this is actually a new crisis that they are still becoming acclimated to. So prior to last week's uh, uh, large-scale invasion, the international community tied Azerbaijan's border incursions with Nagorno-Karabakh. That changed last week. So we're seeing a shift in discourse. So the conversation that the international community uh, has been indifferent would have been correct prior to what we saw uh, on September 13. After that, the international community is realizing that this is no longer about Artsakh, that this is no longer about borders, but Azerbaijan has much larger designs. This explains uh, the, the direct and active involvement of the United States. Um, this explains uh, the level of uh, criticism that Azerbaijan received at the UN. And it also explains the fact that almost no country, with the exception of Turkey and Pakistan, defended Azerbaijan. So whereas, you know, in the past or in 2020, uh, you saw a lot of countries saying, listen, both sides have legitimate grievances and we understand what Azerbaijan has, is doing. And, you know, we're not going to get involved. We're not going to criticize. All of those arguments were basically negated uh, after September 13th. And the international community, to a large extent, stopped with this whole both sidesism. Now, of course, that's not enough, right? Um, you know, condemnations, concerns are not leading changes in the ground, but they are shifting the narrative. And an important thing to consider here, for 25 years, Azerbaijan was active in shaping the narrative. So when they did invade Artsakh, everybody was basically accepting the fact that 
this was inevitable because it had been embedded in their way of thinking that Azeris have a right to do this, these are their territories, etc., etc. They shape narrative. Now it's Armenia's turn to shape the narrative, that Azerbaijan is invading Armenian territory, this has nothing to do with Artsakh, and this is a sheer act of revanchism. So, like I said, instances of concern or condemnation might seem not as relevant at the point, but it is an indicator that the tide is shifting and we are beginning to shape a narrative. And, you know, Azerbaijan has spent millions and millions uh, throughout the world through caviar diplomacy and all the laundromats and all the corruptions to see shape its image. We can argue that that image has to a large extent been dismantled because of these developments. Um, and so the shaping of narrative on the Armenian side is crucial. So I want to give that context in the sense that, yes, international community cannot immediately address the issue. But the whole objective is to build a structure, a narrative, a modality argumentation and resources so that you could incrementally start uh, addressing this problem. Because when you're the weaker actor, you really cannot expect the international community to solve all your problems for you. You've uh, already begun addressing this point about the context that led us to the attack that was launched on the night of September 13, 2022. So can you tell us more about the context of that attack? Yes, of course. So, um, you know, there were obviously a lot of conversations about uh, Azerbaijan's uh, massing of troops on, on, the, on the border, equipment movement. So uh, there were so certain concerns, uh, obviously, that something was brewing. Um, the magnitude, of course, was not clear. And, you know, we knew it was a matter of time before Azerbaijan initiated hostilities. Um, some information that that could be disclosed right now. Uh, in April, we knew that Azerbaijan was attempting a, a large-scale incursion. But the United States luckily shared this information with the Republic of Armenia. Armenia was able to amplify this through back-channel diplomacy. And the European Union got more aggressively involved. And Azerbaijan's attempt was temporarily suppressed because of international pressure. And the negotiations continued. Now, the negotiations, the way they have been proceeding in Brussels between uh, Prime Minister Pashinyan and uh, Aliyev in ba Baku has not gone the way that Aliyev had anticipated it would go. In essence, he's not able, he has not been able to impose his will in the negotiations, and he's not able to get sort of the victor's peace, the victor's prize, as he had anticipated. And the latest... Uh, Negotiations in Brussels clearly indicated this. Both sides demonstrated that they were uh, that no breakthroughs had happened, and it became very clear that the uh, demands that Ali is pr presenting, Armenia cannot in any reasonable way accommodate. And so, the relative breakdown of the most recent Brussels negotiations, which was about two weeks ago, was the trigger that led to this recent incursion of large-scale invasion. And Azerbaijan's objective, contextually, is very, very straightforward. If I cannot get what I want through negotiations, I'm going to get what I want through the use of force. So this recent large-scale large -scale invasion is, supposed, is to be understood within this context. So the most important explanatory variable as to why it happened now or why it happened at the magnitude it happened you know, it's very, very straightforward. Azerbaijan is frustrated that they're not getting what they want with the negotiations, and they're trying to create a larger crisis, which would give them a stronger negotiating mechanism, stronger leverage in forcing Armenia to concede to what the Azeris want. Um, now, the international community obviously understands this, um, and Azerbaijan, I don't think, was anticipating the level of backlash it got from this invasion. Uh, but that doesn't mean the issue in any way is solved or suppressed. Um, but overarchingly, you know, the, the attack on 36 Armenian settlements, the, the uh, destruction of over, you know, the 200 houses, as you noted, uh, uh, you know, casualties over the 200 range, mass dis displacement of, of, of civilians. Uh, this obviously resonated differently with, with the international community. And, also, we have to understand contextually that Azerbaijan also suffered unexpected losses. 
um, when they engage in warfare with, with Armenia, they always utilize their special forces. This is the this is the change that we've seen in the modernization of their army and their military doctrine. And this is why they showed they were so successful in 2020. Uh, in this large-scale incursion invasion, they did use a lot of special forces. And they did suffer a lot of casualties, which was not anticipated. So there were a combination of factors uh, that explain Azerbaijan's uh, large-scale incursion and also why they agreed to a ceasefire. Because fundamentally, observing the scope of the operation, understanding the contextual political background that I just explained, uh, I, did, I do not think Azerbaijan had anticipated only a two- or three-day operation. They had un- anticipated a large invasion to Armenia, absorption of Sunik, uh, excuse me, absorption of Jermuk, and leveraging of this to basically force uh, Yerevan to make serious concessions. The fact that didn't, that didn't happen, the fact that they were stopped, you know, about uh, f- five kilometers from, from Jermuk, and the fact that a ceasefire was signed suggests that things didn't go their way. But it doesn't mean that they were defeated or it doesn't mean that the issue has been solved. So there's the political context and then there's the military context. And for Azerbaijan, the military context is designed to support their political objectives. According to analysts, Azerbaijan was occupying roughly 40 square kilometers of Armenian territory before the attack on September 13th. Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan stated that Azerbaijan is now occupying an additional 10 square kilometers of Armenian territory after this attack. And I'd like to ask, um, to what extent are Armenian lives disrupted and endangered by the presence of Armenian, um, the presence of Azerbaijani troops in Armenia's territory? And what does this indicate about the military success of Azerbaijan in this operation? Well, the, 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 the disruption is expansive. Uh, you, know, you know, everybody living in the border villages is consistently terrified and concerned about developments. Um, you know, Jermuk was to a large extent evacuated. Um, same thing has happened in, in, in the southern villages uh, and res- the centers of population in, in Sunni. So there's a severe disruption. And of course, this river reverberates throughout the country because it's a small country. So there are a lot of concerns in Yerevan as well. So it's not a question of only lives being uh, disturbed by these developments, uh, but also Azerbaijan's objective is to create a humanitarian crisis. If you see a mass number of Armenians leaving, living these territories and basically evacuating or having internally dis, internal displacement, right, this creates a humanitarian crisis. This creates a severe disruption in the country's economy, in the country's functionality, and also in the country's political stability. So in this context, there are also socio-political implications to what Azerbaijan is trying to achieve. Um, so to answer that your question, that their military strategy is not isolated to specific, uh, you know, killing uh, of Armenian soldiers or, uh, you know, uh, conquering Armenian military posts, so on and so forth. That's one part of it. But there's also the broader collective objective of traumatizing an entire society. Uh, Azerbaijan's objective at this point, and this is an expansive part of their hybrid warfare technique, is, you know, to create war fatigue among the Armenians. And the logic is that you traumatize them to such an extent that they don't want to fight anymore. Therefore, through the most simple uh, or, or, you know, in, increase the magnitude of the threat, and Armenians will give concessions because they're fatigued. So all of these are sort of, you know, a collective uh, strategy that they have, which is a use of, use of hard power by invasion, but as well as gray zone tactics or hybrid tactics to create, uh, you know, severe concerns, disruption, stability within society as well. Since you mentioned war fatigue, one thing that was very interesting to me following this attack was that there were reports from Azerbaijani dissidents and opposition figures and uh, some things seen on Telegram as well that indicated a certain amount of war fatigue in Azerbaijani society with people complaining about young men just dying and dying in scores in these successive attacks. So this has been a uh, you know persistent issue uh, in Azerbaijan. It's very difficult to doc- document the extent of it because it is a closed authoritarian society as far as information flow is concerned. 
but uh, that is a, that is an important point uh, that is also part of the configurations here. Uh, the high loss uh, in, in special forces that Azerbaijan had, their casualties were, were not what they expected, so this did reverberate in their society. The underlying argument after the 2020 war was that Azerbaijan was victorious, that their society supported the war, their, their society supported a president that they usually uh, hate because it's a dictator, and this was the sort of you know, the, the prevailing narrative. But society has not seen the dividends from this war. Their economy hasn't increased. Their life has not improved. And apparently, this war was supposed to be the war that ended conflict for that society. But it doesn't. It continues. So Azerbaijan society is attempting to understand why are we still having losses and you know uh, deaths from our so uh, respect to our soldiers. How is Armenia, uh, according to uh, Aliyev, such a depleted and weak country, able to kill so many Azeri soldiers? And nothing is changing economically or so socio-politically. So in that context, the continuity of, of, of war is not resonating well in Azerbaijan. And if you've uh, realized, if the audience has realized, Azerbaijan, is, uh, the government is actually sort of taking steps to suppress any dissent. Um, you know, social media is being very, very strictly uh, censored or to a large extent uh, monitored by the authorities. Those who even express the slightest uh, of dissent are, are labeled as traitors and targeted. And of course, even if you just observe simple things like the funerals that are taking place, these are state controlled. Uh, you know, the, the molas, when they do sort of the ceremonies for the dead soldiers, uh, end up praising the, the uh, president and engaging political speech as opposed to sort of, you know, the religious rituals that they had in the past. Uh, recording of funerals are, are forbidden or controlled. Uh, and so you're seeing this sort of, you know, a uh, very systemic behavior. And that suggests, obviously, concern that it's not only an issue of war fatigue, but Azeri society is no longer buying into uh, Aliyev's attempt to justify warfare because society is not getting the dividends. And these are important things to consider. Is it possible that if Aliyev was considering launching a full-scale war against Armenia, hypothetically, which is something that has been suggested by a number of analysts, is it possible that Azerbaijani society would be resolutely against it and they would make their displeasure known? Um, not, not to the extent to which uh, one would assume. Meaning, listen, uh, you know, armenophobia is institutionalized in Azerbaijan. It's part of their political culture. Okay, so the average Azeri uh, student, you know, who becomes an adult citizen has a venomous hatred of the Armenian. Uh, it's you know, obviously it's not their fault as a human being; they're conditioned to become that. But then they are created to be basically political monsters who uh, celebrate the torture of women, the decapitation of other human beings, and so on and so forth. So this is social conditioning instituted and implemented by the government in Baku. Now, to expect that kind of a society to be, you know, uh, up in arms over a conflict with Armenia, it's not going to happen. But you can expect them to be up in arms when that conflict with Armenia is having domestic, economic, social repercussions. So... We can't expect domestic instability uh, in Azerbaijan to be a byproduct of the continuous problems they've had. You know, low wages, their GDP is less than Armenia's, lack of economic growth, excessive corruption, and of course, uh, extensive oppression of societies, authoritarian regimes. Those are the factors that would trigger some kind of instability. A conflict there with Armenia will not. But if conflict with Armenia uh, aligns or serves as a, as, as a trigger to those existing problems, that's a different subject of, of conversation. But in of itself, a society that has for long celebrated the demonization of Armenian society, they're not going to rise up uh, against this regime over that. So it's going to be other factors. And overarchingly, you know, Aliyev's quote-unquote honeymoon with Azeri society after the victory has died out. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of literature that suggests that, you know, dictators tend to initiate uh, interstate militarized disputes to suppress domestic dissent. So it's not only in this context, the issue of Artsakh and the issue of Armenia and Azerbaijan or Baku getting what they want through negotiations. There are important domestic indicators that we have to uh, include into our considerations when trying to understand why Azerbaijan becomes aggressive or why they institute incursions and invasions. 
You provided a brief military analysis of the September 13 attack on Twitter with the understanding that you are not going to reveal a lot of information that you do know about military matters in Armenia. Based on what you can tell us, what is your analysis of the military disparity between Armenia and Azerbaijan? Um, so the disparities are multi-tiered. One, of course, the financial component is not comparable. Azerbaijan has expansive resources from their oil wealth that they do apply to their military. So they have low social spending, relatively speaking, but very high military spending. Armenia is a democracy. Uh, it cannot basically take money from its citizens and apply it to the military in the way uh, Azerbaijan does. But that doesn't include that Armenia's uh, a percent of its GDP has not been increased in military spending. It has. But we're just basically speaking a less revenue country than oil-rich Azerbaijan. Our economy is healthier and more diversified, but they have a resource that brings them more money. Also, Azerbaijan is ahead of the game by 15 years. Whereas, you know, Armenia's previous administrations, and even after 2018, to some point, this administration did not keep up the power parity. Azerbaijan's power parity exponentially increased. So it's trying to catch up with the oil-rich dictatorship who pumps billions into its own force in a matter of years. There's just a nonsensical thing, conversation to have. So those factors at the macro level are important uh, explanatory factors. Specific logistical issues and doctrinal and tactical factors are also very important. Uh, Azerbaijan's military reforms have been uh, robust in the extent that they have emulated their army to look like Turkey's. So they have NATO training, they use NATO tactics, they use NATO uh, strategic uh, uh, attack models, and they utilize uh, maybe non-NATO weapons, but in a fashion that NATO utilizes. So even the utilization of firepower is modeled on NATO warfare, which is basically the next generation of warfare. Uh, Armenia's military has not reformed. We have what we have since 1994 to a large uh, extent as far as tactical training, development of soldiers, military strategy, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a disparity in funding. There's a disparity, of course, in firepower, in quality of weaponry. And also there's a disparity in quality of military leadership. Now, subsidizing the Turks, of course, uh, Azerbaijan is, of course, is the presence of Turkish military as well. Whereas Turkish uh, military consultants and generals are actively involved in war planning or battle planning, strategic planning for Azerbaijan, Armenia does not receive this from Russia or anyone else. So in this context, we're also at a disparity on intelligence. And this is a, in military science, which is a bigger, bigger problem as well. And finally, of course, uh, you know, aerial superiority that Azerbaijan has. Armenia has made some inroads, and I can't discuss this, but there have been some inroads in attempting to address uh, Azerbaijan's exponential uh, disparity in UAV technology, so on and so forth, that they've received from Azerbaijan. Uh, but whatever inroads Armenia has made is not sufficient at this point, and it's a work in progress. So between quality of training, uh, you know, quality of soldiers, uh, the disparity in their special forces and ours, uh, and from anything from military strategy to technology to, to funding, there is a severe disparity. And of course, uh, amplifying that is the fact that we've learned that since 2020, Russia has not been selling weapons to Armenia. So our biggest provider of arms and weaponry is not selling thing weapons to us. Now, the reasons for this are multifaceted. Their preparations for the Ukraine war, their current uh, struggles in the Ukraine war, and the fact that they're also having due to sanctions, difficulty in uh, producing the weapon that they need. So if they don't have what they need for their war effort, how could they provide it to us? All of this has sort of, you know, contributed to the severe disparity that I had kind of mentioned, as you noted. So these are the factors that we are uh, working with. And, you know, the, the solutions, of course, are also just as complicated, but the disparity isn't simple to, uh, um, you know, weaponry or, or, or funding. It's a lot more nuanced. I know this is a very long conversation in itself, and um, I'd love to have this conversation in the future, um, but for the purposes of our interview today, can you tell us briefly about some of the steps that Armenia could take in the short term and the long term to improve the Armenian military? So, uh, you know, low-scale reforms did develop uh, after 2020. We, Armenia instituted uh, a three-month training program for uh, 
conscripts. So instead of just being thrown into the fronts, they go there well prepared. Uh, you know, uh, logistical issues have exponentially increased as we saw uh, last in last week's fightings. Uh, tactical uh, improvements have been made. So incremental changes in the simple operation of battle are suggesting in, uh, exponential improvement. Um, so that's one important part of the, the reforms that we're seeing. Broader reforms are a lot more time-consuming and complex. Armenia, for example, has a law uh, to establish territorial defense force, very similar to what the Ukrainians are doing. There's a work in progress, uh, but again, that takes time to develop. Also, we have to understand that our reforms are not being helped by anybody. Usually, to have successful reforms, you have to have both sufficient uh, uh, monetary uh, capabilities as well as transfer of knowledge and expertise. Uh, our alliance with Russia, our membership in the CSTO, exponentially decreases our ability to attain that knowledge. Whereas you might have, for example, willing countries like uh, France, like United States, uh, in conversation suggesting that they could provide some form of assistance in the realm of military intelligence and, and, and tactical training. Uh, but as long as we're members of the CSTO, they're not allowed to do that. So our reforms are also hampered by the uh, existing security uh, alliance that we find ourselves in. So our security partners, in essence, are not supporting our reforms, and they're not able to provide us funding. At the same time, by virtue of being partners with such actors, we're also not able to access resources outside of that alliance. So Armenia at this point is caught between a rock and a hard place by virtue of simple things such as trying to attain reforms. And uh, more to the point of, you know, macro reforms in the military, 90% of Armenia's, uh, let's say, not just generals, but uh, higher ranking officer corps, let me put it that way, are, are all trained in Moscow. So the training that they have is not compatible to a large extent with the form of training that you need for the higher up to be able to implement reforms. So being able to implement reforms also requires a certain level of expertise and knowledge. Armenia's military leadership does not have that. Uh, so in order to be able to achieve that, they have to bring outside advisors and experts, which brings us back to the problem of being part of the CSTO and thus being unable to bring the experts that we need. So it's sort of this, you know, a, a vicious cycle that we're stuck in. Now, uh, you know, after what happened on September 13, um, we're creating cracks in that vicious cycle and we're in, in the process of escaping it. Um, and, you know, it was recently announced that Armenia will begin buying weapons in the international market, regardless of CSTO obligations. So this is a very big, important step. And more robust uh, steps will be taken to speed up the reforms. This is an indication that Armenia can no longer operate business as usual and rely on Russia. There has been a lot of discussion about Armenia transitioning from having a primarily conscripted military force to a primarily paid professional military force. Is this a realistic idea? And if it's accomplished, does that mean that mandatory military service for young men will end in Armenia? So, um, you know, most uh, professional armies in the world are voluntary, right? They're not conscript based. Um, you know, Russia is a conscript based army but they have uh, specific battalions that are uh, trained differently for uh, their BTGs for military, uh, for military operation, uh, operations. But obviously the Ukrainian war showed that they're not what we thought they were. Um, so conscript armies do perform based on the existing literature and research uh, relatively poorly in compared to professionalized armies. Now the fusion of a conscript and a professionalized army is sort of the preferred model to go with because you don't have a size, a population size to have a professionalized army to the magnitude that could meet your security needs. Uh, what so small countries are doing, and I don't want to mention names because we're going to basically model borrowing, what certain small countries do is they do have professionalized army, but they also do uh, mandatory training where their conscripts are part of the reserves. So you have continuous reserve training, but you also have a standing professional army. And that is the model that Armenia will be uh, attempting to proceed with. So yes, it is realistic, but again, it's a time factor. Okay. So whereas, for example, right now through a conscript army, you can have at the time of necessity 40,000, 50,000 soldiers, 
you cannot immediately have 40, 50,000 professional soldiers. You have to develop this professionalized army. And so, you know, being constantly under threat, you do not have the luxury or the resources to develop that professionalized army. So Armenia needs a period of peace to reform its army, to create that professionalized army, and then develop a conscript reserve system that complements it. But it's definitely doable. And to the second part of your question, it doesn't mean uh, that there's going to be an end of service. No, for a small country that's constantly under threat, you will have continuous mandatory service. But those serving will be in the reserves and not thrown into the military because you do have a professional army that will meet those needs until you have full mobilization. Azerbaijan has been seeking this corridor through Armenia to Nakhichevan. It was reported that this was an issue in negotiations from the beginning when Robert Kocharyan was president. There's even a story that Azerbaijan offered to dig an underground tunnel road so that Armenians' lives would not be disrupted by this road. I think one of the issues is that Aliyev has repeatedly proclaimed that there will be a corridor through Armenia, and so he would be seen as having failed if he doesn't accomplish it. Others say the real objective is to cut off Iran's access. Why does Aliyev want this so much, and how does he envision it? And what is the real practical significance of a road through Armenia that connects Azerbaijan to Nakhichevan and Turkey? Okay, so the concept of a road in of itself is not an issue. It's discussed in the trilateral peace, uh, ceasefire agreement, and it's been part of the negotiations that were opening up roads and networks. The concept of a corridor is an artificial construct that the Aliyev government regime created as a leverage. Uh, in the ceasefire agreement, there is no discussion of a corridor. And so the question isn't having a road. The question is, what would this road look like? According to Aliyev, that road is supposed to look like a corridor that is controlled by Azerbaijan. From the lens of Armenia and the international community, that is an absurdity because you cannot have your own forces running a road or a corridor on the sovereign territory of another country. So this is an indirect uh, statement by a position by Azerbaijan by basically saying we want to violate Armenia's sovereignty and we want Armenia to agree to this by giving us a corridor. This is why this conversation isn't going anywhere. Um, but if we're talking about ha allowing access from, you know, Azerbaijan into Nakhichevan, that has been agreed upon. Armenia has uh, uh, agreed to allow road, but that road will be controlled by Armenian forces and Russian forces as part of the trilateral ceasefire. So the question isn't the road. The question isn't access to Nakhichevan, et cetera, et cetera. These are, you know, uh, uh, completely different co conversations. The objective is the corridor serves as an exercise in leverage and imposition of uh, Azerbaijan's will on Armenia. And Aliyev wants that to the maximum because he thinks he could get that by virtue of using force. Now, there are, of course, other conversations. Aliyev is claiming that when the negotiations were taking place for the November 9th ceasefire in 2020, that it was verbally promised to him there would be something similar to a corridor. Um, I, we don't know how true this is. Okay, And, you know, and one never takes a dictator for their, you know, for the word that they give. But uh, the, the narrative that they're shaping is this was promised to us and we want it. Whereas Armenia, Russia, Iran, the United States, France, Europe, everybody is basically saying that's not how this works. You can't have your own controlled corridor through another country. Um, this remains the issue. Uh, the underlying, of course, objective is, again, to use the notion of a corridor to force Armenia to concede uh, Artsakh. Baku's position is that if you don't want us forcing a corridor, then recognize Artsakh and stay away from our territorial integrity. This is fundamentally what's getting at. But this is not a question of a transit link. Uh, Armenia is offering that road and that transit link. So this is really a power play that ultimately ends up being about Artsakh. And also, I'm going to refer to Eric Hakopian again because he says such interesting things. And um, one of the things that he said was that um, Aliyev really does not want the road because it would actually benefit Armenia more than it would benefit Azerbaijan or Turkey. Um, what would you say to this statement? 
And yeah, Eric is right on this. We've had this conversation so extensively between each other. Uh, listen, Armenia has a diversified economy. So the more roads you have, the more access you have, democracies do better economically than authoritarian regimes. So clearly, uh, this is going to benefit Armenia more than it could ever benefit Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan's economy and trade is exponentially limited. They're they're entirely a country that is relying on natural resources. So their production, their manufacturing, their service sector, all these things that are part of gauging the economics of a country, economic growth of a country, Armenia is doing much better than Azerbaijan. So in that context, of course, opening of roads is going to lead, uh, statistically and proportionally speaking, uh, beneficial for Armenia than Azerbaijan. Turkey is a different matter. Turkey's economy is a lot more diversified. It's a lot more developed. So, you know, Turkey isn't concerned about Armenia's uh, economy in that context, but Azerbaijan is. So uh, there is uh, quite a bit of wisdom in, in what Eric is saying as far as Azeri is not wanting that road. And in this context, if this road isn't to serve an economic purpose, a regional integration purpose, but rather it is used as a prop by the uh, Aliyev regime to claim at home that they're dominating Armenia or taking things and thus glorifies regime, right? Everything else becomes a secondary conversation. So uh, the, the underlying argument that we're making is that it's not about the road. It's not about connectivity. It's not about economics. It's all about Aliyev seeking to create leverage where would allow him to use or impose his will at Armenia whenever he wants or whenever he can. The United States appointed career diplomat Philip Rieker to the post of senior advisor for Caucasus negotiations with an accompanying statement stating that it was committed to helping Armenia and Azerbaijan negotiate a long-term political settlement to the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. These types of statements have been made before by France and the U.S., which are the two U.S. OSC Minsk Group co-chair countries, and of course Russia is the third country. Mr. Aliyev has stated many times that there is nothing for the OSC Minsk Group to do because Azerbaijan has resolved the Nagorno-Karabakh issue by force with the war in 2020. Mr. Rieger embarked on a diplomatic trip to Yerevan, Tbilisi, and Baku. Some analysts believe that the fact that Aliyev attacked Armenia when Philip Rieger was in Yerevan was Aliyev's retaliation against U.S. statements and actions. So uh, there are certain uh, analytical bases for that claim. When we triangulate the data, uh, it does suggest that this was not accidental. This was timed. And, you know, there's some uh, even some arguments that says uh, Aliyev is waiting for the storm as festival to end in Armenia because there was so much international uh, attention there. Uh, that soon as that ended, uh, he carried out his uh, large-scale invasion. Um, and with Rieger being in the region, it coincided, but also correct. It sent a a message to the United States, although it was a, a faulty message, as uh, the Baltimore suggested, that uh, Azerbaijan maintains the posture that the Minsk group is dead. So it's not a question him saying, I don't want to work with it or what has nothing to do. Aliyev has directly said the Minsk group is dead. His point is that he has solved the uh, Artsakh problem. He has solved the Nagorno-Karabakh problem. So according to him, there is no Nagorno-Karabakh problem. In that context, what is the purpose of the Minsk group when there is no problem to solve? This is his argument. Of course, the United States and France completely disagree, as does Russia. But Russia's disagreement is different. Russia says, no, there is an Artsakh problem, but I'm going to solve it uh, in a trilateral structure. Whereas France and U.S. say, there is an Artsakh problem, uh, but we're going to solve it through a Minsk group. So Aliyev is saying one thing, the three powers are saying something else. Now, Rieger's visit, of course, is not accidental. The United States remains adamant in its pol policy, in its position that uh, the Artsakh issue is not resolved, and you have a 150,000 population of indigenous uh, ethnic Armenians that are threatened. Everybody realizes that. This is why no one is letting the issue go. Um, but the extent to which uh, Azerbaijan is going to be successful with this it kind of suggests that they're not because even the message that they attempted to uh, send to the United States did not work by virtue of what we saw happen with the imposition of the ceasefire and the subsequent uh, diplomatic pressure that we, we were able to see from the United States. But, you know, 
whether this, the Minsk group is able to be revitalized or not is a secondary uh, question. The issue is seeing active engagement by France and the United States in this conflict. Now, if that's done through the Minsk group, great. If it's not done through the Minsk group, but the Minsk group is basically used as a platform for back-channel engagement, that is also acceptable for Armenia. But if you, you have limited U.S. and French involvement, things do not look good for Armenia. But the more uh, involved that these two actors are, there's a more of a balanced approach, and Armenia could receive some diplomatic cover because we obviously lack the military deterrence capabilities in this, in this whole conflict. The attack stopped on September 15, when Azerbaijan announced that they had initiated, I'm quoting, a unilateral humanitarian ceasefire. I have to comment on this ridiculous phrasing because Aliyev is not a humanitarian. In fact, he's the opposite. He looks to see how he can inflict the maximum amount of human suffering on Armenians by targeting civilians, mass shelling of civilian areas with no military value, shutting off the gas supplies going to Artsakh in cold weather, intentionally destroying property, and even setting forests on fire. In this latest attack, they prevented ambulances from helping wounded people and tortured POWs in the most unspeakable ways as a form of psychological warfare. So it was logical to assume that the only reason Aliyev initiated and adhered to a ceasefire is that a country that he is deferential to pressured him to stop the attack. Um, absolutely. But also, uh, the, the whole discourse of Azerbaijan claiming a unilateral ceasefire is to save face domestically, right? Because why are you going to a ceasefire if your power, uh, army is so powerful, but Armenia is so weak, Armenians are stupid, you're smart, they're depleted, you're dominant, you basically crushed them with Operation Iron Fist in 2020, so why are you going to a ceasefire if you're doing so well? So clearly, right, domestically, this is why he, they, they coined that concept. But realistically, correct, uh, the, the extensive pressure was from the United States and France. Russia initially tried to play some role. They were not successful. So this was, to a large extent, a U.S. pressured ceasefire. It's not a question of uh, Azerbaijan being differential to uh, U.S. claims, but rather of fearing the political consequences and potential economic consequences uh, of their activities. So that is, that is uh, the, the context. But um, fundamentally, you know, this is a, is a very tenuous ceasefire. Um, I don't think it's going to last um, because by virtue of Azerbaijan's grand strategy, right now they're working on not finding a peaceful solution, but finding ways where they could keep continue their grand strategy. So they're going to engage, for example, with the United States, take some steps, suggest that they're working on fixing the problem, and then they're going to sabotage that problem and then say, we have no choice, we have to use force again. This is a continuous process. So the question isn't when uh, will Azerbaijan reinitiate hostilities? The question is when. Uh, and this is where uh, two factors come out. The fact that the ceasefire was uh, initiated and imposed by the United States suggests that Azerbaijan has limited wiggling room if the ceasefire was initiated and implemented by Russia. Meaning, violating the ceasefire will also be taken as an affront by the United States. And so uh, the United States will view this as Azerbaijan breaking its promise, because when you commit to a ceasefire, you're uh, promising, right, diplomatically promising, committing to cease hostilities. And so in that context, the U.S. as the arbiter of the ceasefire does have some leverage, and Azerbaijan cannot as easily break it as it would if Russians had, for example, initiated it. But it still does not mean that, uh, you know, they are so terrified at this point that they won't break it. And the question now, that the, the important uh, uh, factor that could allow us to better understand uh, how long this ceasefire will be sustained is to basically uh, try to gauge how much political cover Turkey will be giving to Azerbaijan. If Turkey tells Azerbaijan, listen, uh, you have political cover from me, it's okay, break it, push it for a day or two or a week or two or whatever, I'll, I'll cover you and then we'll see what happens, then that's a different dynamic. But if Turkey says, listen, the U.S. is very adamant about this, you don't wanna, we don't want to upset the Americans, so lay low for now, 
that's a different factor, right? We're being hypothetical here. But, uh, you know, the, the role of Turkey in either encouraging or discouraging Turkey is going to be very important when the American dynamic is involved. What about a threat of possibly imposing sanctions on Azerbaijan from the U.S. or the EU? What effect would that have realistically on Aliyev and Azerbaijan? So I had an article recently that covered, you know, the Biden doctrine basically coming to America by virtue of the comments that uh, Nancy Pelosi was making. And we're seeing that this was an organized, a much broader uh, agenda. And uh, the underlying argument is that uh, the Biden uh, doctrine is defined by preserving democracies and viewing democracies as important in the United States being able to establish spheres of influence in given regions. So if you have democratic allies, you can establish a more influential, influential sphere in a given region. Whereas if you don't have democratic allies or democracies are being threatened by authoritarianisms, that creates to less reliability. I'm kind of uh, uh, summarizing it real quick in a nutshell. And so the underlying assumption is when Nancy Pelosi came and they tied Armenia with Ukraine and Taiwan, and recently she said Armenia is at the front of the battle between democracy and autocracy, for the United States, for a country to be the front of anything would suggest a broader global perspective as opposed to a specific interstate uh, conflict. So that's one component of understanding where this is going. Um, so if, in fact, that is the case, right, if my assessments of the Biden doctrine and the uh, inclusion of, of Armenia as a nascent democracy being part of the global fight against autocracy, right, if assuming this is the perception that the White House has, then issue of sanctions do become more prevalent. Now, the, the term is used very, very thing, uh, extensively and thrown around, and uh, I would warn against that. I consider sanctions to be a nuclear option. That is a last thing, a resort that a United States uses against a country uh, when they don't want to use force. And the United States is never going to use force against Azerbaijan. That's out of the question, right? So sanctions remain a nuclear option in, the, in, the, in this context. And the United States will impose sanctions, for example, if Azerbaijan basically keeps violating international law, uh, directly attacks uh, uh, Armenia proper with a mass invasion, and basically ignores every term of ceasefire, understanding negotiations, so on and so forth. So sanctions are a possibility. But we're not even talking about that. The argument that I make is that even the threat of sanctions is sufficient to control Azerbaijan's behavior because Azerbaijan cannot recover uh, any level of antagonism with the United States, both domestically and also economically. And so um, instead of simply talking about, you know, will the U.S. sanction Azerbaijan and being disheartened if they don't, that suggests a fundamental misunderstanding of the complexity of developments or how the U.S. operates. Rather, the concentration should be on back-channel diplomatic pressure and the threat of sanctions. And those are important observ observations to try to understand developments. And so my, my argument would be sanctions remain the nuclear option and not the automatic go-to option that many think is the case. In response to Azerbaijan's attack on Armenia in September, Iran has massed a significant number of troops and weapons on its border with Azerbaijan. The head of the National Security and Foreign Policy Committee of Iran, Vahi Jalalzadeh, said recently, I'm quoting, Iran will turn the dream of changing the borders of the region into a nightmare. Iran's officials have made clear that similar um, statements have been made many times. Some analysts describe a worst case scenario in which Iran attacks Azerbaijan and Turkey moves to defend Azerbaijan, which can potentially draw NATO into a conflict with Iran that NATO does not want. What do you think about Iran's statements and reactions to Azerbaijan's attack on Armenia? So, you know, uh, analysts tend to make exaggerated statements and they fall go into this sort of hypothetical that becomes a slippery slope. Um, I don't think no one anywhere, anywhere close to that, in that context. Um, listen, Iran really doesn't care about Armenia. Iran cares about its strategic interests, its regional interests, right? Between sanctions and all the problems that it has, it cannot allow its lifeline to the north through Armenia be shut off. It's very simple. So this is an important geostrategic and in broader sense, uh, you know, uh, access to the outside world issue for Iran. 
So Iran's not going to allow anything of that sort to happen because assuming that a Turkish uh, Azeri joined incursion or invasion to a uh, Sunnic lesser absorption, that would mean Iran's access to the north is controlled by relatively hostile countries. That makes Iran completely dependent on countries that it doesn't like or one may argue it hates. So it is in its strategic interest not to allow that. This is the context of the conversation. Um, Iran is not going to attack Azerbaijan. If there is some kind of an invasion into uh, Sunik, Iran will move either forces or allow I think, uh, or give Armenia weapons, even though that's a complicated issue in of itself, uh, to defend against the invasion. So it is possible that Iran will move troops into Armenia to basically repel uh, uh, the incursion, the invasion. But Iran is not going to invade Azerbaijan proper. So this is kind of a, a relative misunderstanding. These are very, very important nuanced uh, aspects. But uh, one thing is obviously very, very straightforward. Yes, uh, it is absolutely unacceptable and intolerable for Iran for there to be any changes as far as uh, its connectivity to Armenia. Uh, and they cannot allow that. It's a lifeline for them. On September 17, U.S. Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi led a congressional delegation to Armenia. During the trip, she held a press conference where she was asked some very important questions by Armenian journalists. What do you think about the implications of Speaker Pelosi's visit to Armenia and some of the statements that she made during the press conference? As I noted, I think this is part of a broader agenda. The, the, the existing data supports that, the empirical reference support that, and the things that she says support that. Um, she wasn't simply here to uh, visit Armenia or give Armenia you know, a, a vote of confidence or support. That's one part of it. But uh, before the speaker landed, she made a declaration. And when she landed, she made a policy statement that it is the policy of the United States to defend democracies against autocracies. And as I noted, this is consistent with the Biden doctrine. And so the, the uh, uh, speaker had no reason to tie Armenia with Ukraine and Taiwan. Yet both face the same situation. There are democracies, nascent democracies, being threatened by more powerful authoritarian regimes. So the fact that the framing is done in such a fashion, and even with the speaker recently uh, returning back to the United States and regurgitating those same statements, this goes to show that this was not, you know, an off the whim visit, but this is part of a broader U.S. strategy. And uh, earlier today, Lynn Tracy, the U.S. ambassador to Armenia, also noted that, you know, it was a pleasure to host Speaker Pelosi and how they had organized this and that, which suggests that, again, this was part of a broader organizational effort. You know, the third most powerful uh, individual in the U.S. government isn't going to visit a small country of three million. Uh, for a minuscule reason, okay? Uh, they're not going to undertake the attention, this activity that brings the attention of the entire world to her visit in the same way that in Taiwan for a minuscule reason. So I need to, the context here is very, very important. That doesn't mean Armenia is saved. It doesn't mean, you know, Azerbaijan is so terrified that they're not going to do anything, no. But her statements, her visit, the structuration and the organization of the visit and the broader, broader agenda indicate that United States is now an active player in the region. And uh, I do like to note the fact that the United States does see a power vacuum in the region and they are going to step in. Because this wasn't just specific to uh, Speaker Pelosi. In basically a three-day period, Secretary Blinken spoke several times with Prime Minister Pashinyan. He also spoke with several times with Aliyev. Uh, you know, for the Secretary of State of the United States to be so actively involved in the, you know, in the conflict of two small countries, relatively speaking from a broader global uh, structural lens, is a clear indication of where U.S. involvement is going with this. So I think uh, Speaker Pelosi's visit, statements, uh, the people that she met are very, very important to note. And one final thing, comment I'll make on, the, on this topic is that uh, it was not in the Speaker's agenda to, sp to, to meet with Defense Minister Suren Papikyan. And so the fact that her agenda was changed and she did do a visit to the defense ministry is clearly an indication that there's a lot more going on here than simply a congressional delegation visiting Armenia. 
There are two things that Speaker Pelosi said during the press conference, which I found interesting. One of the things that she said was that there are flaws, and I'm paraphrasing, she said there are flaws in the language of the trilateral agreement of 2020 that have now become apparent. And then the second thing that she said was, she said that we are here to listen to Armenian officials as to what their needs are. And so what I'm inferring logically is that if you're willing to listen to someone's needs, that means that you're possibly considering helping them fulfill some of those needs. Most definitely. Um, you know, the, the trilateral agreement from the lens of pure uh, diplomatic uh, uh, content analysis from the lens of international legal analysis, it is a very, very flawed document. There's a lot of vagueness, there's a lot of incoherence. Uh, you know, a simple point where we keep coming back to this, for example, are the Russian peacekeeping, peacekeeping troops. There are no rules of engagement for these troops. So uh, a, a serious ceasefire document with peacekeepers would have something like that. And there's, a, again, this is a small example. And then there's obviously a lot of, uh, you know, uh, vague uh, interpretive issues as well, et cetera, et cetera. So it is very, very flawed. And her point was that Azerbaijan is using the flaws in this document to misinterpret it and impose, attempt to impose its will. So the, the, that's been very straightforward. As far as her statement of, uh, you know, the United States is here to listen. Okay, this is a very, very important statement because she's not here saying, listen, uh, I'm here on my own as a member of Congress trying to listen to what you're going to say, and I'm going to take it back and to see what I can do. That's not what she's saying. Okay, she said, I'm here as a third most powerful person in this country, uh, and Biden is basically asking me, and I'm obviously, you know, I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, obviously, uh, that Biden or the White House is basically asking me, what can we, how can we help Armenia? But that how they can help Armenia with the fact that they're listening also has its own serious parameters. Um, it's a question, it's not simply a question of, you know, what do you want? I'm going to give it to you. It's a question of what do you want and can I give it to you? Um, so what Armenia asks has to be commensurate with what the U.S. can do. You know, there have been some conversations of can Armenia kick out Russian troops and bring in Armenian, uh, thing, uh, American troops? Can Armenia leave CSTO and try to join NATO? These are nonsensical conversations, okay? So if you make demands like that, the United States, the United States is not going to take you seriously, right? But if the demands, for example, are, listen, we need to purchase, for example, anti-drone warfare, and we need our own loitering drone, drone ammunition, and we can only purchase that from certain countries that you have sanctioned. Can you give us a waiver so we can purchase it? That's doable. Can you share military intelligence with us if Azerbaijan is getting ready to attack so we can be prepared? at least to evacuate civilians, not to have a humanitarian crisis. That is achievable, right? Can you tell, share certain military technology so that we can build our own weapons? Can you, if you cannot sell weapons to us, right, can you at least mediate with certain countries that can sell to us and provide us guidance on defensive weapons, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot that could be done at the technical level that could enhance Armenian security architecture with U.S. engagement. So this is what we're talking about. You know, we're not talking about, hey, U.S., come and save us. Are you listening to us? Come and do it. That's, you know, we have to be realistic about what, what we can ask. But the fact that they are listening is very important because I will tell you, I will make two points. Um, during 2020, during the war, the United States did not want to listen to us. They said, you know, um, you made your bed. Uh, we told you for 20 something years, this is going to be the outcome. And we really cannot help you. But yes, we, we can do our best to attain uh, some kind of a ceasefire, a peace. We're going to work for it diplomatically. But anything outside of that, we're not listening. So for the longest time, Armenia has been fighting just to get the U.S. to listen to us. Now, the United States is saying, yo, you don't have to fight for us to listen to us. We're listening to you. Plus, we're asking you to tell us what you need. So that in of itself is a very, very big uh, uh, improvement in relations and what we could potentially get out of it. Isn't it also relevant of the change in presidential administrations in the United States? Because not to get too far into uh, U.S. politics, because I always want to focus on Armenia, uh, but, uh, you know, the Trump administration was known for being isolationist and feeling that the United States had no obligation to help other countries with their problems. 
And so the Biden administration does not share those views as evidenced by the amount of aid that has been given to Ukraine and um, in other places as well. It's not just Ukraine. So isn't it that um, it's the different philosophies of the Biden administration versus the Trump administration that has in some ways led to more engagement with Armenia in this conflict? Right. Every administration, every president has their own foreign policy doctrine. That's what we spoke of the Bush doctrine. We spoke of the Obama doctrine. There was some form of a Trump doctrine that's uh, also, it's actually it's known as neo-isolationism. And then there's the Biden doctrine. So each administration has its policies or as they understood what to be within the strategic interests of, of the United States. So this is nothing specific to Armenia. But at this point, correct. Uh, Biden is going to be in power for the next two and a half, three years into the elections. Okay, And then after that, we don't know what's going to happen. So this is the precise time for Armenia to buy time, utilizing whatever this document is, uh, to, to reestablishing our military capabilities and becoming prepared to defend ourselves and to develop deterrence capabilities. Uh, what happens after that is a secondary issue. However, at the same time, if you develop institutional relations, bureaucratic relations, entrenched relations, even if there is a shift in administration and policy, bureaucratic relations sustain themselves. So strong interactions with the State Department or strong relationship with the uh, Department of Defense in the United States, those are not going to be entangled because there's a shift, there's a change in the administration. Uh, those, you know, administrative grand strategies or doctrines by the administration by an administration do not deal with those, you know, minor, specific, nuanced issues. That is interbureaucratic. In that context, um, you know, presuming, let's say, you know, in the next elections, Trump come, comes back to power, or or it's DeSantis, or whoever, whichever Republican wins, assuming there's a, there's a there's a shift in uh, in the elections. Uh, this does not mean that whatever has been built in the next or whatever is going to build in the next three years is going to be thrown away. That's not how the State Department works. That's not how the Department of Defense works. In that context, we need to concentrate on developing institutionalized relationships with the United States when it comes to security and diplomacy, and then uh, basically tweaking or, or mitigating or making alterations based on the new administration and based on the new doctrine and policies. You've actually addressed my next question to a large extent, but I do want to ask it specifically. And that is that based on some statements that were made by Emmanuel Macron of France, some Armenians have inferred that France has offered to give or sell weapons to Armenia. What do you say about this theory? It's, it's not a theory. It's a fact. Um, the, the previous ambassador, uh, France's ambassador to Armenia, Jonathan Lacroix, uh, we had several meetings uh, and he had basically said, yes, France is ready to provide some uh, kind of military assistance to Armenia pending negotiations and understanding of these relations. Uh, uh, so this is not a secret. Um, and Macron uh, has also made these offerings to the prime minister in their meetings. The issue is when Armenia came back, uh, when the government came back and talked about what this may look like, Russia immediately stepped in and said, absolutely not. And so uh, Armenia was basically unable to tap into the French offer by virtue of Russian presence. But again, this was pre prior to September 13. This was last year. And a lot has changed, right? We're realizing that the Russian-led security architecture has collapsed. And so now the, what was uh, offered by the French can very likely still be on the table, if not more. Um, you know, certain uh, proposals are being developed. I'm working on, on one of those myself. So I, I cannot discuss that. But, you know, uh, and, you know, this is not a secret as far as uh, Armenia are trying to buy weapons in the outside market. Uh, a very prominent uh, parliamentarian, uh, Andrei Nikolchadian, who's head of the uh, defense uh, committee uh, in parliament said, we are buying, trying to buy weapons in the open market. Uh, but what that looks like can be discussed at this point, but that is a, there's an attempt to happen that. Uh, Armenia had a very large delegation that went to India to, to purchase Indian weapons and so on and so forth. So it's a work in progress. In this context, it's not a theory, it's a fact, but how that fact becomes a reality where which we're able to get those weapons and bring it to Armenia, that is clearly a work in progress. And I can say how long it's going to take, but we're definitely working towards that. 
I just want to um, talk about dollar amounts briefly. So it's been reported that Azerbaijan spends roughly two and a half billion dollars a year on military spending. And um, Armenia, the figures um, that are openly reported do vary, but um, it's been reported that it's about $300 million. So what are the correct figures for, the, for both countries? No, so right now, Armenia's military budget is over 750, uh, and it's exponentially higher for its GDP, but there are no other options. Azerbaijan's ranges between three to five billion. Uh, sometimes, you know, Ali would say we're spending six billion on weapons, but uh, you, a lot of that money, you don't know how it's being allocated or how it's being used. But clearly, it's way more than ours. But there's also another issue here. Annual uh, assessments of budget is insufficient because you're playing catch up. So they might have, for example, some 20 billion weapons in their arsenal. You have zero, right? Uh, you're playing catch up. They, they have possibly, for example, they may go and purchase the Iron Dome anti-missile system from Israel. You're never going to get the money to purchase that. And your S-300s that you have from Russia really aren't that effective, right? Uh, things of that sort. So existing uh, inventory is also a big part of it. Ours is depleted. They keep replenishing. So even at some, um, in some magical way, we come close to matching their annual uh, funding, we still need to catch up. And so this is the important thing to consider. But uh, to, to uh, yeah, answer your question specifically on the, uh, on, the, on the budgetary factors, Armenia's is about 750, should be going towards about 800 million uh, by next year. And Azerbaijan's usually supersedes the 3 billion mark. France convened a session of the UN Security Council on September 13 to address the attack on Armenia. As I mentioned before, all previous incursions on Armenia were blamed on undemarcated borders. On September 19, there was a meeting between Armenia's Foreign Minister Arad Mirzoyan, U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken, and Azerbaijan's Foreign Minister Jehun Bayramov. Is it possible that the United States and France think that Aliyev's unprecedented attack on Armenia has crossed the red line that has caused them to want to take proactive action to prevent even worse attacks or even a full-scale war? Uh, absolutely. Uh, with the level of involvement we're seeing from the United States clearly suggests that from U.S., uh, both diplomatic and strategic perspectives, uh, Azerbaijan did cross a red line. Uh, and this is where you're seeing more active involvement by the United States. France had said for a long time that Azerbaijan is an aggressor, their behavior is unacceptable, so on and so forth. But it's very important to, to make one point. Every diplomat that you speak with in Armenia that's from Europe, and we always ask them, have, you have this, I have these conversations extensively, you know, what is your involvement, your country's involvement, how much can you help, why aren't you commenting on this, why aren't they commenting on that? And the consistent responses convince the Americans and we'll be on that wagon. European policy towards the region is heavily influenced and dictated by American posturing. In this context, and this gets to the question you're, you're posing, once U.S. realized or, or you know, recognized that a certain red line has been crossed, U.S. took the position that it did, and everybody in Europe fell in line. France was obviously ahead of the game, but if you look at what happened with the uh, U.N. Security Council, for example, Ireland, Norway, um, uh, all these countries, are, you know, I'm missing a few on top of my head, that were on the Security Council, they were making the same points that the United States was making. Azerbaijan shelled inside of Armenia, this threatened civilian infrastructure, the wording, the narrative was similar. Okay, so you whatever the U.S. position is, Europe is going to take the lead. If the U.S. has no position, then Europe is going to try to figure it out on, the, on their own. And because Europe is driven more by diplomacy than security guarantees, their posturing isn't always sufficient. And so this is why the involvement of the United States is so, so crucial, because it could potentially lead to some form of coalition building that could diplomatically protect Armenia from whatever Azerbaijan's grand strategy is designed to do. Armenians are facing an existential threat today in Artsakh and Armenia. If Armenians are attacked by the genocidal alliance of Azerbaijan and Turkey. Recently, 
A radical Turkish politician publicly said, Turkey has the power to erase Armenia from history and geography. President Erdogan of Turkey is the person who has helped to turn Aliyev's ambitions into reality for his own purposes. He has praised the hollowed soul of Enver Pasha, one of the three architects of the Armenian genocide. Armenians are mourning the deaths of thousands of Armenians since 2020, and many Armenians are rightly wondering if this violence is ever going to stop. Armenians worldwide need to be proactive in demanding that the international community pay attention to Azerbaijan's crimes against Armenians. We hope that there are countries that are willing to protect Armenia by restraining the power-hungry ambitions and grand plan of the Aliyev regime, as Dr. Kopalian talked about in this interview. When it comes to geopolitics, there are many opinions and predictions about what may happen, and many of these are doomsday scenarios. Today, we discuss the state of Armenia's military because Armenia must be prepared to defend itself by reaching its full potential military capability. And as Dr. Kopalian has explained, Armenia has a lot to do to reach parity with Azerbaijan's military capability. So as um, the situation tends to evolve, um, very few things um, that the diaspora can do, for example, to improve the situation for Armenia um, remain few in of itself. But primarily, it's a question of funding and a question of transfer of knowledge. So as Armenia attempts to develop a military-industrial complex to become more self-reliant, expertise and transfer of knowledge is important from the diaspora into Armenia. I think this is a very important conversation that needs to be had. Um, Armenia, in essence, stands alone right now. It has a diaspora, but the involvement remains very, very limited. This is not a question of fault. Most don't know how, how they can help, what they're supposed to do. And so these are multifaceted issues. But fundamentally, the problem stands as is. Uh, Armenia, to a large extent, can be considered to have been abandoned by its Russian ally. And it stands alone. And so the conversations that we're seeing about unity, the conversations that we are seeing about mobilizing our resources, uh, we are getting to that point. We could rely on the international community for some level of diplomatic support. We could rely on the United States, on France for some level of support. And even if need be, the Russians may help us as much as they can considering their circumstances. But overarchingly, Armenia is getting to a point where it could no longer rely on other countries and have the dependency that it's had for 30 years. And so when we talk about all these issues from security to the funding to military to domestic factors, the underlying f objective is that unless Armenia develops and progresses and grows, it is not going to be able to sustain itself. Now, what we have seen is democratic development in Armenia. What we have seen is economic growth in Armenia. So we are seeing slow, methodical progress. The objective is for the Armenian world to support this as opposed to attempting to sabotage it for narrow political reasons or creating complications that also further make our situation even more precarious. And so going forward, you know, my last comments are defined by a few things. If you're an international expert, security expert, scientist, your assistance is needed in Armenia. If you want to have any way of involvement, please do so. But those are not going to address our issues. We need to change the way our, our, we think. We need to have a paradigm shift in our mentality. We have to accept the fact that unless Armenia becomes a powerful democracy, a self-sustaining democracy, the problems that we see is going to be continuous. Narses, thank you for joining us today. I also want to thank our viewers for watching. My guest today is Dr. Narses Kopalian. Dr. Kopalian is an Associate Professor of Political Science at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. His fields of specialization include international security, geopolitics, political theory, and philosophy of political science.